Um, what I'm going to talk about from my side is um, derived from thinking that I've been doing around uh, ongoing project living standards and material culture in English rural households, 1300 to 1600, uh, which Alice is also working on and doing a sterling job, which is funded by the Levy Hume Trust. And uh, Sarah's research also, coincidentally, is, um, is also supervised by the, uh, it's also funded by the Levy Hume. Um, and um, it derives out of a chapter which we were invi invited to write for a book on material culture, where we were given um, the vague title Object Worlds to work with. Uh, so we sat down and tried to figure out what we wanted to cover in this topic of Object Worlds, and we came up really with um, some ideas around the relationship between material culture and text, if I may dare to go into that realm again. Um, so, as Chris pointed out earlier, uh, I've been um, quite um, critical of some approaches which see material culture as text. Uh, and really, I think what I talk about here isn't necessarily the application of sort of literary theory, which um, highlights the multiplicity of meanings that text can, can um, have, but more the more, more simplistic approach to reading archaeological objects as having a meaning which um, pre-exists ahead of action. Um, and we could maybe see that, for example, in, in that we could look at Sutton Who and we could read off information about identity and say that these, are sim these objects are symbols of identity or something like that. And I find that problematic and a bit simplistic. Um, and what I want to talk about really here is um, moving on to thinking not about material culture as text, but to a certain degree, text as material culture, um, but also objects in texts and how we can think about um, how the process of writing about objects in the past um, did something to those objects. And I'm also going to have a sort of twin um, metaphor, if you like, which is that of hoarding. Um, and I'm going to try and draw a link at some point between um, hoarding and writing. Um, hoarding, of course, is a means of concealing objects. Um, <laughs> And we can read those objects off. We can see them as symbols of ritual behavior, as special deposits and all that kind of thing. But we can also think about the process of hoarding as a process of narrative building and memory generation. So some of you will be familiar with this nice little um, video clip, which they uh, put at the end of the first episode of Detectorists of this season um, to show how the hoard of cold coins, which uh, they come agonizingly close to finding but never quite do, uh, found its way into the ground. So we can think of um, hoarding as process. So rather than thinking about it as a closed off assemblage, which we want to interpret and read meaning from, we can think about it as a process of memory building, of meaning making. Um, and in particular, um, what we've thought been thinking about is the idea of concealing and of objects having <laughs> potency or power or vibrancy. And the way that by burying objects, and we have all that talk about ritual um, breaking of objects in particular, the magpies, that's still the coins now. Um, but uh, we have a sort of idea of neutralizing um, the power of things. And this is something which has come up in discussions of objects as having personalities, particularly Andrew Welton's recent work where he's done archaeometallurgical analysis of um, Anglo-Saxon swords and looked at that in the context of writing like Beowulf and the idea of swords as having personalities and being powerful. And we can then um, extend from that to think about... Um, I'll stop that, let's get distracted. Uh, <laughs> we can think about objects as having biographies, of that deposition being part of that biography, maybe of trying to kill the object, but also of building a narrative around that object, um, creating new stories around that object, maybe building a legend around the object through a process of votive um, deposition. And of course, as these objects are then rediscovered, they become part of new narratives. They might become a part of folk stories. They might become a part of an archaeological narrative. Um, they um, may be interpreted in a whole load of other ways. Metal detectorist finding it will turn it into a narrative about personal pride uh, and that kind of thing, for example. And therefore, whilst the idea of biography is quite useful for thinking about objects, um, I found slightly more fruitful, actually, in this regard, the, the idea of object itineraries, drawn from the writing of Rosemary Joyce in particular. Uh, there was a session on object itineraries 
uh, tag last year. And I was quite negative about the idea at the time, but as I've stewed on it over the following months, I've actually found it quite a productive idea. And the key contrast between the idea of object itineraries and the idea of object biographies is that a biography is a linear story, effectively from birth through to death. An itinerary takes the idea that um, the trajectories that things take can be more fractal, that something can go off in multiple directions and, crucially, can be multiple things at the same time. And this is where the idea of writing about things um, comes in, because we can think about the process of writing as an episode in that object's itinerary, and through being written about, it becomes something else which maybe transcends its material presence, um, which is an interesting idea to think with, I think. So this is the first document. This is Winfled's will. Um, this is Sarah's bit, so hopefully I won't, I'll do it justice. Um, so we see in the Anglo-Saxon period the process of wills um, coming about, um, and we can see objects itinerating through the text. And Anglo-Saxon wills we need to think of as a form of <laughs> ritual performance. And wills determine the trajectories of things. Through the process of writing a will, you decide that this object will go to this person, this object will go to this person, and through performing that ritually, um, reading out through the text, things aren't just being recorded in these texts, they're passing through them. They're becoming something else, they're having obligations attached to them. Their biographies, their trajectory is being determined by these processes that they go through. But it's also creating a new form of materiality, the document itself. Um, it's preserving what is lost in textual form. It's preserving that sort of ephemeral um, process of um, performance associated with the objects by textualising that moment in time. So it's not just recording an object world. It's not just saying that there were these objects, there were chests, there were bed curtains and linen, um, but rather it's creating an object world in itself through this process. And this is an idea which I've also been thinking through in relation to our work, which focuses on later medieval lists of goods and chattels rather than inventories. We've been told off these inventories by the historians. Um, so these are the, the sort of historical data set for our project um, derives from um, documents such as this, which are found in the um, records of the Royalist Cheetah and of coroners of the later period um, who were royal officials and basically if you had someone who was a felon or who committed suicide who fled the manor um, then it was the, the right of the crown to seize those goods and these lists of um, goods were produced uh, and sometimes we get valuations attached to these um, goods as well. Um, so we can have a, a record here of the goods which were present within a home or at least some of those goods, you'll notice that there isn't any pottery, uh, for example. Um, so this um, particular list comes from the house of someone called uh, Geoffrey Plomber. Um, it's a late 14th century inventory from Northamptonshire. Uh, unfortunately, I neglected to write down the backstory of Geoffrey as to why he had his goods uh, forfeited, uh, but it was probably debt. That was most of them. Um, so we can see, to a certain degree, that this is a list of the goods and possessions of this individual. But I think we can see it as more than that. I think we can see this as a process of converting these possessions, these things, into words. And this conversion isn't a passive process. It's a process through which value is being created. And we can see that most evidently in the cash valuations which are being put against these things, which aren't, we don't think, market values. They're judgments about the value of these objects. And crucially, we're not just seeing um, lists of things, but we're also sometimes getting a little bit of information about these things. And this is the reason that I chose this particular one, because it's one of the few inventories that we have, sort of goods, of, lists of goods, that we have in our um, sample, which has some adjectives. So you can see one of the broken brass pots, and I'll come to the broken pot in a second. But we need to think of these not just as descriptions, but as implications for the trajectories that these objects could take. This is just a gratuitous uh, image, because I love this image of the sack of coroner's records um, from the National Archives. 
So my argument here is that texts don't just represent things. Um, rather, they are an actual articulation of the things themselves. Um, they create opportunities for things to erupt from the past um, through archaeological research or through processes of administration. Things which have been lost are able to come back to the surface because they are preserved in textual form. And also things circulate through texts. Things like those valuations would presumably have been understood by other as cheaters and would have played into how they went on to value those goods when they performed this process of seizure and cataloguing in other contexts. So I think what we can see is objects itinerating through documents as emerging in another form and actually being transformed in themselves through this process of textualization. And this is where the idea of itinerary, itineraries is important because those objects preserve as material, they survive as material form. That material form goes off and has all sorts of other adventures which are in no way related to the way in which it's represented in the text. But by being in the text as well, it stays as another kind of thing as well. So we can think of objects as being multiple in themselves and existing outside of their material form. And I think this probably plays into the ideas of virtual and actual, which um, Gavin was talking about, about last night as well, actually. So let's go back to Jeffrey's broken pot, which unfortunately we don't have a picture of because they didn't illustrate the list of goods and chattels, but it probably looks something a bit like this. Um, we don't know why this pot was broken. We don't know if it could still function, if it had a big hole in it and the, good, and the uh, stuff would have leaked out, or if it was just the foot was a bit knocked or the handle was um, not intact. But I think that the description of the pot as broken has implications for its trajectory. I think what it probably meant is that this is no good as a pot. We're valuing it not as a pot, but as a piece of scrap metal, which can be recycled and melted down. And of course, we then lose that object archaeologically, but it persists in the document. And these processes are really, actually, uh, these process description are quite important and contextual and actually relate to the kind of object which is being produced in the documents. We can draw a nice parallel between our description poor as cheetahs inventories and the inventories which Daniel Smale has looked at from the Mediterranean, uh, which are very rich in the detailed descriptions. Because whereas our goods are being seized and sold, the Smale, in Smale's context, um, <laughs> inventories are a part of a process of a mechanism of debt and recovery, whereby these objects are effectively being seized, but then being held onto by a pawnbroker, and someone could go back and say, well, actually, I want my pot back because I can pay my debt now. And therefore, you needed to have a very detailed description in the written document so you could, you could prove that this was your good and not someone else's object. So um, this process of writing is really important in terms of thinking about ideas of possession, um, which wasn't really a concern with the as cheaters, but was a concern um, in the Mediterranean context. And I think we can also see other processes going on um, in which objects and texts intersect, and particularly commercialization. And I think through commercialization, we see an increase in documentation. And this is something that Martha Howell has talked about a lot in a low countries context, whereby as you get um, freer movement of goods, less constraints on how goods can circulate, that, uh, that texts come to play an important role in maintaining social order and determining how goods can be circulated through the use of um, tools such as inventories and wills. So it becomes a way that they become a way of maintaining wealth and maintaining social order. And this is where I'm sort of drawing the think about drawing the parallels with hoarding, is that if you think of hoarding as a way of concealing an object, um, stopping it from being a potent object, if you textualize an object and cause it to have to um, progress along a particular trajectory, you're taking away its capacity, its potential to be socially disruptive by falling into some other form of um, social relationship through which it shouldn't have a part. So through incorporation into legal documents like wills and inventories, we can see objects as circulating as commodities with a monetary value and as being different to other goods which are circulating, for example, as gifts for which their social value is more important, that they're linked to 
um, processes of mutual obligation and gift giving and so forth. We can also think about wills in a later medieval context and um, talk about Renaissance Italy. Um, Samuel Kern has used wills to talk about how these um, documents can be seen as a expression of a desired trajectory for objects. He argues that they become a mnemonic device for remembering the individual who bequeathed that object and of neutralizing its commodity potential because by determining the trajectory that the object could take through um, listing it in a will, it stops people just selling it off. They actually have to keep this memento of this person and they are therefore have an obligation to remember this person as well. So this process of textualization has implications for the objects. It creates an obligation for these objects to circulate in particular ways. And we can also think about um, the ways in which wills were used strategically, um, for example, um, bequeathing in accordance with sumptuary laws um, to make sure that um, objects weren't just going to people who shouldn't have them because they were objects above the state that, uh, their station, but also making a statement about the individual and how they wanted to be remembered as someone who um, knew what their place was in the social hierarchy. Now, textualization also has implications in that it creates object worlds. Um, we've heard about book fittings already, and obviously the process of writing things down creates new types of objects and allows these objects to circulate more widely. So, for example, objects such as um, steely are associated with writing, parchment prickers, and those kind of things. And, of course, these commonly have associations with ecclesiastical sites, but also in urban contexts, seemingly with mercantile households in places like Winchester and York. So we can see that we can associate then these essentially being objects of power over these object worlds, as being um, in the hands of the people who are able to determine the circulation of these things. So I think by thinking about the ways in which objects itinerate through medieval documents, we can think about objects as being multiple. And that's not to say that um, one thing, there isn't just one thing, but rather saying there is one thing, but in itself it is multiple. There is only one reality, but that reality is multiple, as um, the philosopher Ian Buchanan puts it. Textualization and consideration of the ways in which objects itinerate through documents shows how medieval stuff isn't just reducible to physicality. We can see that this process of textualization, if we take it seriously, has implications for the ontological status of things. It actually makes them something different. It's not just a way of representing them. And as such, it's a way of controlling objects' worlds. So it's not a case of representing a social order or representing an economy, but rather it's a way of pre preventing those social norms and order from being challenged. It's um, a way of managing the disruptive potential of the material for society. So as such, we can see texts not as containers for knowledge and perceptions, but as fundamental for understanding things in their more material form. So to sum up, um, our position really is that we don't think documents just record the material world. Of course they do that, and they're very useful for doing that, but they do more than that. The process of writing about things has implications for the things themselves, and that's as much a case as if you include, if you're writing an archaeological narrative about a thing as those things being written about in the past. And things don't just um, be rep aren't just represented in text, they're itinerating through them. This process of textualization is transformative. And this has implications for how we work interdisciplinarily, um, in that um, it requires a mindset change into how you consider documents, how you consider the relationship between archaeology and text, and dare I say it, it gives the archaeologists the upper hand over the historians because we're demanding that they see their writing as a form of archaeological material culture, and they're just a very special type of archaeologist. Um, so, basically, as a key point is that we need to account for these textual processes in how we understand archaeological remains, and not just use the process of reading and writing as a metaphor, but actually understanding it as a transformative material process. Thank you.